Welcome back to The Short Game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I'm Reagan Kelly, and I'm joined by all my awesome co-hosts once again for the last time in 2017. Laura Nash, how are you doing, Laura? I am very glad that these games existed in 2017 and not glad for most of the rest of the year. <sighs> Except for my marriage. That was good. <laughs> that was good. That, that part was good. <laughs> nice save. Nice save. <laughs> yes. Good save. Uh, Nate Heininger, how are you doing, Nate? Oh, I'm doing well. This was a great year for video games, uh, particularly games that we cover on the show, and I'm excited to uh, to kind of look back a little bit. Yeah, and uh, Shane Kelly, my bro host. How you doing, Shane? I'm doing great. I am uh, also, uh, yeah, I mean, you guys said it all. To, this is the year of the good game. And the year of everything else being miserable. <laughs> yeah, sorry, everything else. I don't know. Movies had a pretty good year in 2017, too. Oh, yeah, you might be right about that. 2017? Fine. Pop culture in general for 2017 can get a gold star. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for keeping us sane. You know what it was? It was the year for escapism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And this episode is our big end of the year spectacular. We're going to be talking oh, about... Oh, I had a kid. That that was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Same also. <laughs> Right. That's a good thing about 2017. <laughs> you guys both had Ditto. Kids. Birth of my son. <laughs> so personal lives. Game of the year. I would have said that, but I didn't think we all were going to go around and list also good things from the year. <laughs> um, I had some fantastic sandwiches. Uh, I've been working on my buffalo wing recipe. It's getting better. I, I got a really nice pair of slippers for Christmas. I, you were showing them before we started recording they look nice i'm wearing pajamas with cats wearing headphones professional podcaster pants yeah so with all this great sidebar which i'm sure is going to cut most of it no, quality this is great podcasting. radio this is what people come to the short game for rambling about personal <laughs> lives and sandwiches yeah well th this is our big end of the year episode we're going to be talking about the game of the year or the short game of the year 2017 as well as just a bunch of other kind of wrap up for 2017 um but yeah, just to sort of dive right into it, uh, we kind of decided the last couple of years when we've done our uh, Game of the Year episode, we've we've done a whole elaborate tallying of the votes on air. And this year, just the way that things worked out, uh, it didn't quite make sense for us to do that. So we're going to just open by talking about what is the short game Game of the Year, or in this case, kind of Games of the Year, because, uh, dear listeners, off air, we had a truly brutal yeah. melee we have we've been fighting <laughs> uh podcaster to podcaster about what is the short game of the year and it's come to a stalemate and we have two games we could not narrow it down past our two games of the year 2017 yeah i, I think uh the the mix and the sort of switch in format and just like naming something or naming in this case, two games as the game of the year and not like ranking everything makes a lot of sense because on the last episodes, we would always start with like a 10 minute, like sort of speech about uh, like ranking doesn't make any sense. And why do we rank things? And then we would proceed to rank them. And, and this time so, we're spending uh, that 10 minutes talking about why we're not doing that. Well, I <laughs> we're not. So, so the next year will be we will be efficient <laughs> straight and into the point game of the year, unless we come up with some other scheme. This year, there's also a lot more consensus. I mean, yeah. I will go ahead and spoil the Let's two games, it. which are well, you can't spoil on a reveal podcast, but <laughs> the games are Night in the Woods and Pyre, episodes oh, so one seventeen and one twenty nine, and they're both really, really good. Even though I didn't finish Pyre. Oh, but that's part of the reason that we're so split this year. Um, we had more episodes exactly. this year where where uh, two or three of us were on rather than four, and so I think all of us played Night in the Woods. Only three of us played Pyre. It came down to a vote between the two, and it was kind of two and two. Night in the Woods. Just to recap for the folks who may not have uh, not have joined us for those past episode, uh, Night in the Woods was episode one seventeen. I one hundred percent recommend going back and checking out that episode, and it's my personal favorite of the games that we covered this year. Uh, Night in the Woods is a kind of a narrative adventure game about a character, May Borowski. She is coming home from college after having kind of dropped out, uh, coming home to her small town of uh, Possum Springs and. Uh, 
interacting with her parents and friends and uh, trying to pick up where she left off before leaving for college, but everything's a bit different. Oh, and also everybody is an animal. May is a cat and uh, her best friend B is an alligator and her other best friend uh, is a, uh, is a, I guess, fox or dog or something. Uh, it's dog. Uh, yeah. He's a doggo. It's a wonderful game. It's full of absolutely brilliant writing and we talked absolutely tons of sugar about that game in episode 117 um i don't know if there's anything much more to say about night in the woods apart from that it was one of my absolute favorite games of is yeah. probably my favorite game of 2017 it's yeah, me too. beautiful it's funny it's fun like it is at its core i would say you know sort of an a uh, adventure game you know mostly you're running around talking to people and and learning the story but they weave a really basic sort of platformer into it just because you know keeps it uh, even more engaging uh, i this has been a game when someone asks me like what should i play what what is what is like the best game that your your show uh does like what should i play to get an idea of what you guys think is good night in the woods is immediately my first choice of games of 2017 it's not what i picked for my number one personally uh but i can't this game is like perfect i mean i'm always looking for games that i can give to my friends who are not gamers friends who generally just play games when i tell them they must pick up this game and play it and night of the woods with a bullet is that kind of game it's got uh silliness and heart and it's really hard to get a game that combines both of those. You don't know when you're talking to someone if you're going to get a fart joke or a poem, and that is one of the most exquisite things I can say about a game. Um, it surprised me. I haven't played the expansion because I think it's it's too cold outside to play a fall-based expansion, mm. but I am so curious what happens when I make different choices. I actually think I'm going to play the whole game from the beginning. Um, I was one of the people who tried to be like, well, 2017 just going to be Night in the Woods, right? People were like, also Pyre, the game you skipped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, but Night in the Woods, though. Yeah, Night but Woods. Night in the Woods, though. And it's also, for yeah. me, it's like the perfect game for 2017. Like, I-, I needed this game in 2017 so badly for two very important reasons. One is it's 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 just got this sort of gameplay loop that's very comforting. It's about hanging out with your friends you know ultimately the the game is a game about interacting with friends and you know in this in this garbage year what do we need more than time with our friends and then in addition to that it's a game with extremely progressive politics that it wears completely on its sleeve it's a game with something to say about america and it had a message to it that i felt was very timely almost so timely that it it felt almost almost preordained, you know, like this game must this game was in development for years, but somehow it felt completely of the moment. I if you miss this game in 2017, this game is it was it it cures what ails you in 2017. Go do crimes. Yeah, go do some crimes. Uh, I do think, if I remember correctly, they actually updated some of the writing even to to make it even more in line with maybe some more uh, yeah, recent what, uh, what, developments. Yeah, uh, what Scott uh, Benson actually said was that very very little of that was actually changed. Most of it just was the way that it was because yeah. that's, you know, that's who these people are. You know, the, these folks, you know, they have this, uh, this outlook on life that just happens to feel very current in 2017. Yeah, one of the things about this game is it really changed what I think games can do. And I I don't really play a lot of games where I am looking for something that's going to be a story about some kind of social issue or or something like that. It wasn't even really something that felt that way to me. It was just a a piece of, of character development. And you don't expect that going into a game where it's all about fluffy animals. So... Yeah, I just it totally blindsided me. I, I'm so glad we played it. And from a personal note, I loved May. I love playing a messed up female protagonist, and I loved her messed up in a different way, best friend B. I think that the story and the quality of characters was so high in this game and so unique and felt so 
uh, so mo- so real for something with cat faces all over it. Um, and I mean, there's a part where you just you know can't handle a party and you go get drunk. And I've actually weirdly seen that in multiple games, but this one actually felt like you were in on the mistake rather than doing it as a looping animation. The character development, I think that's a great call. That I think the the animal part of it is actually while adorable and beautiful again this game is is beautiful um it does allow you to more easily put yourself into those characters you can be b you can be um may you can see yourself in all of these characters um even if it is like a cat or alligator or something else like it might have been harder if it was actually like a human uh you know like 17 year old girl might be harder than like a cat so i do think it was it was purposeful to a degree uh also i think that this game is what you want from it so the the heavy political side of it i i see that um and it was a major part of it but I felt like that was just one sort of through line, an undercurrent of any of, of more like personal issues too. Like, yeah, um, I don't want that to scare uh, anybody off. Um, I I think that it it just it has. Mm-hmm. I think it more more so than just saying that this game has a political stance. It's more just that it has something to say in a way that a lot totally. of a lot of games uh, you play don't. Like even games that seem to have something to say in big air quotes. It, it, it doesn't feel as like fully fleshed out and mm-hmm. and and expressed in a way that is not you know it's it's showing rather than telling you know this is showing you the effect that you know the, showing you what this uh, sort of falling apart mining town uh, is is going through uh, you know and showing you what that uh, what living in this place has done to the people there over generations. It has something to say, and it expresses it so much better than any other game that I've played that I can think of. Uh, it, it, it's it's really stunning that that it, I mean, yeah, I don't want to talk too much about it here. Just go back and listen to episode one seventeen. But damn, I think two of the best things about this game, outside of the writing, are first the incredible art style, which is this sort of maybe dark Chris Ware inspired almost comic-y style when people talk when when you hear a game described as being about cutesy animals you probably have something different in mind uh, than what this game really looks like and the thing Beautiful that really park. was the oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> the thing that was really amazing to, to that really got me I think really got me into the game was the incredible soundtrack uh, by Alec Haloka and uh, and that the soundtrack on this game I think is so important to what it is not just for setting the feel of the game but because so much of the music is music by the characters who play in a band together it really feels like part of the identity of the characters and 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 a part of the story and it just rules it does rule <laughs> it's a great album I still listen to that it was a double a uh, double album like uh, soundtrack and you know if you have a choice i don't know if they bundle this with the game on steam or whatever but if you have a choice to like get or not get the soundtrack get the soundtrack you're gonna want it it's so good i've listened to it so much one last thought on this game for me and it it, it and it stuck has stuck with me since is this game has maybe what my favorite most thoughtful and most like purposeful ending Mm. to a game um and i know i don't we haven't even talked before really going to do spoilers but i we've been keeping it kind of free here yeah spoiler free, i think it's probably so. best if you want some spoiler yeah. talk we did some quite a bit actually in the we have post spoiler content in the uh, night in the mm-hmm. woods episode uh so i just uh, this game they there was you just tell so much thought and effort and 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 um I don't know, thoughtfulness and precision with what they were trying to accomplish and what each character was going through. Uh, it was one of the most satisfying endings of any game that had so many intense, different stories going on at the same time that I can think of. Yeah. So it is awesome all the way through. And, you know, it would have probably, if I were picking one thing, been my pick of the year. But I'm also kind of glad that we ended up with a stalemate so that we can include Pyre as our other game of the year. Uh, Pyre blew me away it's i mean i loved transistor and that was our game of the year a couple of years ago um but this game is absolutely better than transistor like pyre is such a great game 
Yeah, I just talked a ton of sugar on Night in the Woods. We all did. But I could talk even more about Pyre. And that's hard to do because Night in the Woods is beautiful. But Pyre, it, it's... Whereas Night in the Woods was an accomplishment on storytelling, uh, you know, sound and, and sort of gameplay, I thought Pyre did all those and developed a dense, richly competitive game within the game. And that's what, like set it over for me the actual game of pyre was challenging it was intense it was wholly unique uh and and really 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 at the end of the day fun and still a blast to play two player long after i finished the story which you know the Mm -hmm. how many times can you say after i finished an rpg style game i've gone back and played the battle mode the uh the competitive you know, 1v1 right. or 1v CPU mode. I've played a ton of it since completing the story. Even just when I was yeah. visiting Shane, we we booted it up and played a few matches because it's just such a perfect little two-player game. They they could have released just the, the game, the Pyre game, and put like a, a clumsy story around it and said, hey, here's our new fantasy wizard basketball sports game. And mm-hmm. it probably would have done really well, but instead they created this super complex, incredibly satisfying uh, sort of interactive fiction. They they did a lot of interesting work on that um, development that had true player choice in it that actually had major changes on how you played the game going forward. Yeah, really uh, interesting set of, like, not just simple branching paths, but like a system to that narrative where, you know, you were... Uh, depending on many different types of choices, different teams uh, would kind of rise or lower in the rankings. Different characters would uh, achieve their goals and escape the the what, what, do you, what was it called again? The, the downside. You know, different yeah. characters would escape the downside. Others wouldn't. Uh, if you count like every possible permutation on those endings, there must be dozens of possible endings. I feel like even more than that, just. Because of who you let through, if you lost every match, if you, you know, and we had a really good conversation about it in the episode, but the the fact that, like, it's kind of a sports game, but sometimes you feel inclined to lose purposefully is is a true accomplishment of storytelling Mm -hmm. and, uh, like, commitment to the characters. I, I just, this game was so interesting and unlike anything I'd ever played, I, I just... This is one that's going to stick with me for a long time. And because of its added accomplishments on top of story and stuff, I just felt like this is the best total game from 2017, at least for me personally, what I look for in a game. I agree in a way. like, uh, And, and, you know, it's surprising, like looking at other outlets, uh, game of the year lists, I've seen Night in the Woods on quite a few of them, but I haven't seen Pyre on as many. And I'm wondering if maybe that's just because... It's a it's a harder sell right right from the start. I know that when I, my first impression of Pyre was at a, an event and I played the first say twenty minutes or so of it, just sort of standing at a demo booth, and I did not get it. And that was even after playing twenty minutes of it or so, and after you know the uh, I don't know if they were one of the devs or just somebody associated with it, but kind of talked to me through the, the battle system a little bit. Like, it, it was a little harder sell right off the bat than Night in the Woods is, which, you know, has essentially no, like, systems to learn. It's not something mm-hmm. where you have to learn the mechanics of the battle system or anything like that. I, I think Pyre will stand the test of time, so to speak. Like, this is, it's a great game from a great developer. I think people did give it attention. But I, I wonder why, I, I mean, I think it may not have gotten quite as much attention as it deserved. It's an amazing game. Yeah, it can be a slow grind sometimes. And if you're not, if you don't pick up the, the sport part of it very well, it can be frustrating, I'm sure. So that's why Night in the Woods is my go-to for like, this is the game I think everyone should play. But for like me purpose, uh, personally, and what I want from a game, uh, Pyre was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Pyre was absolutely my my game of the year. And to me, I think the biggest accomplishment that it has in terms of like being an RPG that worked as a short game um, is it has a phenomenal structure. And I think that's also part of why maybe some of the outlets didn't like people don't get into it right away 
is because you really have to see the full season structure of the game within the game um, in order to really get what I think makes this game so unique and so good, which is that it it is a game that is designed and structured to put you in a position where you have a like a fun, mechanically complex, um, really great um, action oriented game that is not the most important thing to you as a player because it's not the most important thing to you as a character in the game because you have to have these competing these competing interests and elements and for a game to actually sell you on something where I mean we've, we've said it a couple of times but where you where you might have to make a character based decision in the middle of an action oriented sport type game um, that's unique I've never had to do that I've never I've never played a game that made me and that's why I put it at the top So before we transition into talking about uh, non-short game of the year picks, uh, something we've done the last couple of years as well, um, do do we want to kind of list off any other games that we did cover on the show, short game games that uh, we think are the top of what we covered in 2017? I know I had a personal list. I've got a I've got a list, and I uh, am happy to share. Uh, so I already mentioned Pyre was my personal choice for game of the year. But um, one that we haven't talked about that I absolutely loved was Nex Machina. Nex Machina, uh, of course, you know, is this, um, I think, the final form of the uh, House Marquee um, dual stick shooter. It's the best dual stick shooter out there. Uh, I've, I've gotten so much enjoyment out of it. I keep going back to it. And because it has this arcade feel, I think I will continue to um, load it up on my PS4 and, and and virtually pump quarters into this arcade machine for a long time to come. Um, I don't know whether this made it to the top of your, so so high up on my list, just because I have so much love for the genre and for the developers, um, but. Uh, this might be the last outing for one of my favorite kinds of games. Yeah. So How, a- Housemark apparently did not do too well with Nex Machina, like financially. Like it did not make as much money as they were expecting. And so they've made some announcements about their, their studio kind of shifting gears towards um, not developing twin stick shooters as their sort of primary thing anymore. And they haven't really said what they're going to work on, but they also did say that rather than creating their own custom engines, as they've done with the previous uh, couple of games, or all of their games, as far as I know, they're moving towards using, I think, Unreal or something like that. So a pretty big pivot for them as a company, which is sad for folks who have been a big fan of what they've been doing in the past. I know I... I also totally love Nex Machina. Um, sad to see that it didn't do too well. <laughs> it's one of the few games that um, I did what every developer is at least okay with, which is I bought the game, I just haven't played it yet. <laughs> so I've, su- <laughs> I've supported it. Well, it's it not your design. fault then, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and, I, and it's only out of like sheer game backlog I, I think we could do I an entire uh, short game like end of the year episode on games that we have bought but not played oh god yeah. most of the list of games we haven't discussed yet are in my steam library yeah yeah well uh, what happens so a little peek behind the curtain what often happens for us as the show goes is we'll pick the next game we all buy it then we all play it and we talk about it but then sometimes we all buy the game and then, like, you know, life happens or whatever. We can't all play it. So I end up with, like, a copy of the game that we were going to do. And I'm, like, super glad. Then I listened to the episode that I want recorded. I'm like, oh, I really should have played that. But, you know, I had a baby or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> you know, or other equal, you know, responsibilities. Or I had a really um, good sandwich. Yeah, or I was working on my buffalo wings. But, uh, so we end up with these, like, back catalogs that we 
know specifically are awesome because of our show talks about them so next machina sits in that that category for me yep shane do you have any others that you want to list off absolutely one of the games that i had the greatest amount of anticipation for this year and a game that um just delivered surprise after surprise was what remains of edith finch yeah for me what remains of edith finch was I mean, it's kind of the reason that we made this show is this kind of game, you know, like th- this is these kinds of games where it's a defined kind of bounded short experience that gives you something new, surprising, interesting and and meaningful. Like that's that's what remains of Edith Finch. So really the writing on that one really got you know, got me, and and also just the the incredible atmosphere and constant and shifts of, of of style and gameplay, like constant changing. Yeah. A game as a short story collection is something I I wanted to get connected more on the heart level to that game, but intellectually I was one hundred percent there. And I specifically had on my list the last level of Edith Finch, uh, the. The Salmon Cannery with Ravel's Bolero playing is probably, it's it's an extremely memorable moment. That alone is worth the cost. That that might be in my top 10 video game moments. Yeah, that, that end of Edith Finch, that one, it is, uh, that, yeah, that, I was just sitting there like jaw on the floor, like what am I experiencing right now? And, yeah, and for here. that scene alone, that game is worthwhile and this is also you know on my list too this game is is uh phenomenal yeah and i have one more game that really blew me away this year and it was the sexy brutal Mm. and this game um it restored my faith in uh the kind of puzzly solvy adventure game um i I had been uh, thinking that maybe that was a genre that I was going to leave behind um, because I had played some that I didn't like so much and I kept quitting them in the middle. Um, And what the Sexy Brutal did was it it brought together a really cool concept, um, really goofy, weird, out there art, um, and just a, 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 a really, I would just say good writing. Like it had really interesting characters and the characters were characterized as these little caricature yeah. sorry mm-hmm. yeah i was gonna and, say the masks yeah. well oh well let's let's talk for a second about that artistic choice to have everyone in these elaborate masks uh that really signify their character everything about uh the game was about uh having the characters pop is stylish as hell the game basically had you rewind time to prevent the deaths of people in a really outrageous casino and I think one of my favorite out of recording moments of talking about video games this year was Shane was talking about how much he wanted to play Sex Brutal at a bar in Chicago in person and he got very drunk and he was just like he kept gesturing and the waiter was very worried he was going to spill his drink but he had to tell me how good Sexy Brutal sounded and (laughs) so I yes. will always judge Sexy Brutal like much, much higher because I just remember how much fun it was to talk about. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yes, Shane's love for this game was absolutely infectious. Another, uh, you know, big behind the curtain is sometimes one of us finds a game that we love and it is in the Slack channel like every three days until until we're like, okay, we bought it. And it normally works out great, and that's what this was uh, with Shane and Sexy Brutal. And I'm so glad that you uh, you forced this excitement on us because uh, it was it was a ton of fun. That doesn't happen often enough. Like I love when I love when one of us finds a game. Well, I specifically love when somebody other than me finds a game that they just can't <laughs> freaking wait to play and like force me to go play it. And that's actually always super fun because. You know, then I've got somebody super enthusiastic to, to, you know, well, I've also got somebody who I can ask the puzzle solutions to when, from when I when I get stuck. So that works great for me. That's uh, that's Reagan's number one uh, key thing 
that that can help him enjoy a game is someone who can explain to him how the puzzles are solved. Yep, that's why I get you guys on the show. <laughs> someone who, who's at least a half an hour ahead of Reagan in the game is all that he needs. And if you're not half an hour ahead of me, like, wait half an hour <laughs> because <laughs> I'll be stuck. Don't worry. Um, so my list was pretty simple this year because Night in the Woods and Pyre were my top two games. And I did kind of make a top five. Uh so right below those two, for me, was the Wizard Sniffer. Uh, the Wizard Sniffer was the winner of IF Comp this year. And we did, uh, you know, many episodes on IF Comp this year. And the Wizard Sniffer was easily, I mean, obviously it won the competition, but it was head and shoulders above anything else I've played uh, for IF Comp that I can think of ever, um, I think. And if you are new to interactive fiction... Uh, or if you don't play a lot of parser-based type of games, I think this would be a phenomenal introduction. Uh, we talked about it, uh, I talked about it somewhat at length on episode 135, and then again uh, when we talked about the conclusion of IF Comp. But this year's IF Comp winner, The Wizard Sniffer, is uh, by Buster Hudson, is one of the best games I played this year. And I don't often get to say that about uh, interactive fiction. Interactive fiction is is often extraordinary, often great, fun to play, interesting, uh, small explorations of an interesting idea. Um, but for, at least for me, it, it doesn't usually kind of rise to like one of my favorite games I've played this year, but the wizard sniffer absolutely does. The wizard sniffer is phenomenal. Um, and it's free. So, you know, go check that out. Uh, the other, other kind of games that were the tops of of my list this year tacoma finally came out in 2017 i mean how long have we been waiting for tacoma like it, it, it uh, since episode one it, of literally the short game. yeah absolutely <laughs> episode one of the short game we talked about uh gone home which is still one of my favorite games of all time and uh you know the first game by fulbright and tacoma they're only their second game uh finally finally came out this year and I mean, it it really just speaks to how great a year we've had for short games that it didn't end up higher, at least on my personal list. Uh, you know, who would have believed that we would have ended up with something like Night in the Woods and Pyre and Tacoma all in in one year? And I mean, you know, dozens of other great things too, but like Tacoma was still really, really good. Um, so, you know, don't, don't skip Tacoma if you liked Gone Home at all. And I guess for me, the the kind of rounding out the list would be, um, this is a bit of a cheat because it's not a game that originally came out in 2017. Oh my God. No, we're going to have to have a revote here. I didn't know <laughs> you were pulling things that were maybe not, you know, well, 2017. Well, my excuse is that it had a switch port in 2017 and I played a lot of it. So Puyo Puyo Tetris, um, it, we did a whole episode on the Puyo Puyo series, and actually that was before Puyo Puyo Tetris, the uh, the Switch port, the you know the uh, English localization of the game came out. So while I had been playing some of it, I've played a lot more of it since it came out in English in the United States, and it's on the Switch and also on PS4. So this game originally came out like two years ago. It's not a new game in that sense, but it's new to the U.S. in 2017, and Puyo Puyo Tetris is the best expression of both of those games, in my opinion, that I've ever played. And the mashup between the two is phenomenal. Um, you know, I, I explained my love of the Puyo Puyo series on our episode about that. That was episode um, 114. I think that was actually last year. Um, but if you're at all a puzzle, a action versus puzzle game fan, like if you're a Tetris fan, this is a, a wonderful Tetris game and a great path into trying the superior Puyo Puyo experience as well. Or if you're into Puyo Puyo, uh, then this is a great way to play that on a modern system. It has online play for the first time in an English, uh, in, in a Puyo Puyo game that's been released in English. That's huge. You can play this game online on a US console against people from Japan who will kick your ass at it. <laughs> it's great. So Puyo Puyo Tetris probably rounds up my my, uh, my top five. I would I would have put that in my top five if I'd known that we were uh gonna cheating. allow <laughs> cheating um if we're if we're putting games that didn't come out in 2017 on the best of 2017 list 
I I think I'll just throw uh, Sonic Three and Knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know list. I I downloaded a uh, Nintendo emulator, briefly hit the App Store, and I was able to get it on my iPhone, and I played Pokemon Red for like fifteen minutes again, and so that was a new release to my iPhone. So I'm gonna take everything down and say Pokemon Red is my favorite. The game NES game. Classic <laughs> came out this year, and so I'd like to include Super Mario Three on my yeah. games of the year. It's a great point. That came out last year. Uh, Star Fox. Oh, now I got right. the Super Nintendo uh, classic. I got yeah. the Star Fox 2 uh, on there. So. Yeah, and while we're cheating, I'm playing Witness on iPad, which is both <laughs> extraordinarily long and wasn't released this year. So, <laughs> Laura, do you want to share your, uh, your top five or anything like that before we move on to talking about uh, our non-short game picks of the year? So Night in the Woods was my number one. Um, and then I didn't really rank the last four. Um, I, As I mentioned, the, I didn't like all of What Remains of Edith Finch, but that last level got me so hard. That last level alone made the list. Um, and Tacoma as well. But a couple of people haven't brought up yet. Uh, Lion Light, which is a little puzzler that was oh, yeah. um, a calm, minimalist experience that I didn't know I needed so badly. Uh, until I did. It has come out on iOS since, and it is a hundred times better there. It's exactly, I mean, I liked it kind of like when Mushroom 11 came out. I liked it a lot on desktop, and then when I played it on mobile, it felt like it found its home. Hmm. And uh, Reigns Her Majesty also, I know it's really recent, and so I might have a little bit of that bias, but um, I think it fixed mo- almost all of my issues with Reigns, and uh, I if you're looking for a game that fits into your life, that one definitely does. Because I found myself playing one or two rounds in a lot of places. I had a lot more strategy than I ever did before. Um, yeah, so I think those two games on mobile um, really helped me. I mean, I'm still playing threes, but it's great to have something else to reach Forever. for. Um Lion Light was on my list as well as, as sort of one of the best games of 2017. It was a, a total surprise. It, it 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 reminded me a lot of what like Thomas Was Alone was able to accomplish, which was a, a a very compelling puzzle game while also somehow making me care about you know a uh, a in little this case, line a little line. But in a way, know, even um, more of an accomplishment for Lion Light because it doesn't use any words to do it. It it does it nothing. entirely through gameplay, which was like incredible. Thomas was alone has a beautiful British uh, voice, which will get me to care about anything. So uh, Lionel Light did it without the British narrator. It's quite the accomplishment. That was a stunning game. What else is on your list, Nate? Well, we've talked about most of them already. I had Pyre, Tacoma, Edith Finch, Lionel Light, and then the last one, uh, Sonic Mania. You know, <sighs> yeah. Sonic is a part of my uh, childhood, and and what and it's crazy to me because those games, the original games, uh, have not aged super great you go back and maybe they're not as fun as they were when you were a kid but somehow saw the, the this group of like independent developers you know hired by sega made probably the best sonic game the best 2d platformer sonic game of all of them and yeah. it came out in 2017 and and that is remarkable in its own right um and it, it was just so much fun and i and i really don't think purely on a nostalgia level i just think it was a it was a fun game and it was an accomplishment to take uh in advance that um sonic style and make it faster and modern and more fun um so i I just love that game and i i still go back and do runs because the maps are huge and it's a fun game so that that kind of rounds out the rest of my life that game really um reminded me of why i grew up loving sonic and after having played it, I went back and played some of the originals. I think what we have in Sonic Mania is the best Sonic game. Mm-hmm. And it really is just... It really is about having expanded the exploration element of Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah. Which, you know, it's, it was never a game that, if you'd asked me before, was a game about exploration. But it... it it turns out that like the fun of, of going super fast through these through these levels is about discovery of these new shortcuts and new routes. And so it really improves on replay and it really improves on just really getting in there and and and, and exploring and, and 
throwing yourself against every wall and just, yeah. so I would fun. also I would also argue that the moments of, of momentum are better. I mean yeah. Sonic mm-hmm. the original Sonics had that, but you were so often like you'd get a real good run go run going and then you'd hit like a stupid spike and you just get stopped and you had to it would take a little while before you were able to like kind of get that like run going again you know um unless you had like really mastered the levels this game really seemed to like build in segments that are just like you're just gonna go really fast for what feels like a really long time and you're gonna whip around and you're gonna hit all sorts of new little contraptions that feel very sonic but are new to this game uh, and and then you're gonna stop, and you're gonna have to explore some, and maybe you'll build your own momentum. But then you're gonna hit, you're gonna trigger another sort of chain of insane uh, speed elements, and it, it it sort of put a line between the two for me, or like a wall that made each bit more accessible, and and that's why I think it is better than the older ones, which were kind of stuck in between the two, exploration and speed. Um, and it, it's just a it's a it's a brilliant game, and it's a ton of fun. So. Uh, great. I, I hope there's a Sonic Mania 2, 3, 4. It's like they keep these people together and, and make more of this because I'll I'll be first in line every time. Absolutely. So now that we've talked about our short game of the year picks. Um, Breath of the Wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, right? So we, we should we should chat a little bit about what non-short games. Game what else did we play this year that stuck out to you? Not necessarily as your game of the year or you know, whatever, but like, what was the big thing for you in video games in 2017, apart from what we've just talked about? And why is it Breath of the Wild? <laughs> yeah, I, I gotta say that yeah. this this is a year where it got kind of hard to make this show, and not just because we were all having life, capital L, life events, yeah. right? <laughs> One wedding, two babies. It got pretty yeah, one move, no, one move across, when, across the country. Got, got pretty yeah. serious this year. When you're just getting when you're just getting like the the best Mario game in a decade and like oh, the best so Zelda good. game that I've ever played and the the best of so many different, you know, incredible new games are getting dropped on you and there are these gigantic huge mega experiences like it it, it it's it gets hard to play the little ones, which is what we're supposed to be here for. No excuse. Sorry, listeners. <laughs> yeah, Breath of the Wild came out early, man, and like it. Every uh, half of the gaming press's uh, game of the year list was was locked up like right then. I don't think we probably need to tell uh, listeners why Breath of the Wild was good, but like, damn, it was good. And you're right, Super Mario Odyssey. For me, m- maybe even better they're so good they're both so good and i I, there's no comparing them really but like so good actually i do think there is a comparison of them because i think nintendo has hit on a formula that we're going to see in more and more nintendo games and then also probably just other open world-esque games which is like don't let your player go more than like 30 seconds in a direction if that and not find something fun to do Mario, it's like 10 steps. They can't go more than 10 steps without finding something fun to do. Zelda, they have to kind of build the advent, you know, the expansive world. So there's like the galloping. More like more like 10 horse steps. Yeah, but it is so densely packed with tiny uh, bite size challenges that are individually rewarding. And uh, in Zelda, they reward you with. Yeah, you know, the shrines are the bigger ones, but then there's like the, all the little things for doing the um, uh, the little guys you collect Korok to turn seeds. into seeds. Yeah, Korok seeds. And then in Mario, it's the moons, but also Mario's so densely packed. I mean, you, at any direction you go is going to be something fun to do. So it is just nonstop, um, and, and I think. It, it just works, and we're going to see that with more of these games, uh, especially bigger open world games. I will just say that I don't play long games that often, and I have Same. basically become addicted to Breath of the Wild and Super Mario Odyssey, and that's taken up way too much of my free time because of the Switch being able to take to work. Mm, um, so I will say that I do not have the most social of colleagues. People tend to do a lot of lunch meetings, so I... When I decided that I was, you know, 
need to do something to keep myself sane. I had a recurring appointment that was called meditation and that was called Laura takes the switch downstairs to the coffee shop and plays for an hour. (laughs) Might not be meditation as some people thought it was, but a lot of people were very um, glad that my mindfulness habit was when I was in a good mood the rest of the afternoon. They didn't know I was like catching giant horses and beating up (laughs) bobbikins. Do what you got to do to get through the year, guys. Absolutely, man. And that got like games like that totally got me through the Nintendo Switch. Like who would have believed after the Wii U that Nintendo would have a year like this, particularly like I was really skeptical about the, the switch prior to launch, you know, the, the, the launch lineup of software seemed kind of thin. Uh, there, the, the console was, and still is kind of lacking a lot of kind of basic features. It seemed like maybe they were going to shoot themselves. The, it, it wasn't clear yet whether they're like, grand millennial idea of like i'm just gonna take my switch to my cool rooftop party thing was actually something that people would ever want to do like was this going to be the wii u part two and like honestly they've they've had an amazing year like the switch is totally killing it it's it's amazing really it it's to me what i realize is it's you don't have to be the kind of person that has like rooftop parties uh, in order to love the switch it is a uh it is a console that is designed to just slide right in to whatever open space you have in your life mm-hmm. which hang on i probably could have worded that better but, yeah um, you guys my rooftop parties have been lit though ever since i got the switch yeah. you know we were uh no it's not true Mario but, it up you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just got mine for the for like a month ago. So, but you, awesome. I mean, the, the thing that they they've done and you know, Reagan, you said the switch is lacking in some of these basic features. Here's the thing. It's not, it's not lacking in anything <laughs> that I really care about. What I care about is good games mm-hmm. and they delivered good games. And it, it it's, it's the console that I can play in the two different places in my house where I want to play video games. Whereas every other console that I can buy, I can play in only one of those two places. Yeah. And I mean, so it's, it's really, they figured out something unique and special and that's what Nintendo's always been awesome at. Yeah. Amazing year for Nintendo. And I just, I mean, I can't wait to see what else comes out on the switch into it. And not to mention like the amazing indie games that have been coming out on the switch. Um, You know, Nintendo still isn't the most indie friendly developer platform out there, but they're, they're improving a lot. And, uh, yeah, we did a couple for the show, Blaster Master, uh, yeah. Snimper Clips. Mm-hmm. And there's um, others that I, I want to, to talk about on the show if we ever get around to it, like Golf Story, for example, although that's a little long for the show, so that may not happen. But, like, lots of really wonderful little indie game experiences are coming out on the Switch. And it's, it's I, I think they've really set themselves up for success there because people want their games, want indie developers games on the switch because it feels like a value add. You know, I don't just get to play this on the one place, you know, in my, in my living room on the TV, I can play it wherever I want. That's, that's additional value. That game is worth more to me on the switch than it would be on another console. And that means that, um, I'm, I'm probably more willing to spend a little bit more money on the game. Like I feel like, you know, spending 20 bucks on a game for the switch is absolutely a great price where maybe if that game were on the uh, PS4, I might be like, well, maybe more like 10 or 15 is fair. Like, I feel like it's worth more to me on the switch, which is a weird thing, but it's, it's like they've set themselves up for amazing success with the indie side. Yeah. It's awesome. So my personal game of the year that isn't short game game of the year, like my, my like long game game of the year is one that really surprised me this year because this year I was a hundred percent sure it was going to be persona five going into 2017. I was like so incredibly amped to play persona five persona four is one of my absolute favorite games of all time. Uh, I love all of the characters. It's just absolutely one of my favorite games I've ever played. Um, and so persona five incredibly excited about it. Um, and it is a great game. It is a wonderful game. But surprisingly enough, the game that would be my top choice of Game of the Year 2017, as far as that sort of AAA side is concerned, it was a complete like dark horse, and it was uh, near Automata. And yes, it is Automata. I'm not bending on the pronunciation. I know the developer pronounces it differently. Automata uh, is... How do they say it? 
I think he says uh, automata, mm. but automata is is the uh, is the plural of automaton. It is the correct correct pronunciation. I'm not bending on this, but anyway, near was. A stunning game. But I mean, the artist says. <laughs> but he's Japanese. Do you, Whoa. Don't, don't, don't tell me how to pronounce. Don't tell me how to pronounce English words. Um, the, uh, the, the game is amazing. It's so good. Uh, it's, it almost feels like weird to, like, I don't, I don't want to oversell it and I don't want to spoil anything for anybody because, but the, the number one thing the game did was surprise me. There are so many things about that game that are absolutely surprising. And it's also, you know, it's an RPG, but with the uh, with the action of platinum games. You know, if you've played Bayonetta, or you know, it's the sort of um, uh, descendant of games like uh, Devil May Cry. Uh, it, it has that stylish action uh, gameplay, but it's constantly throwing surprises at you. Um, it has multiple endings, and every one of them is distinct. It's it's insane. Uh, I, this is the wrong show for me to to give like a, a real rundown on Near Automata, but it is one of the best games I've played in a long time, and easily my AAA pick of the year for twenty seventeen. So play it now. I won't. I won't draw out our discussion of Near Automata, uh, or sorry, <clears throat> Near Automata. But you know, I have now. Uh, I've now played through the game 1.5 times, which is apparently not sufficient to fully explore <laughs> the fun. I would almost say that if if you didn't have to play through this game, apparently uh, infinity times to like really get it, quote unquote, that, um, that it would be something we could consider a short game because beating it once was not that long. Um, I am just at the cusp of like one and a half playthroughs, I think. And I still don't get all the sugar this game is receiving. Like, it's it's a very competent action RPG. Hmm. Well, I, I suppose it's probably not going to be necessarily for everyone. But I would say, like, so I don't think it's much of a spoiler to say, like, this game is meant to be played through multiple times. Each subsequent playthrough gets weirder and more different from the last in ways that just get, you know, more extreme. And uh, to really fully to to see all all the cool stuff the game has to, to throw at you, you really need to play through endings A, B, C and D. Um, but if you. You know, if you don't like action-oriented, like action sh- action shooter, action RPG uh, games like that, maybe it's not for you. But for me, the gameplay was super fun throughout, and it never stopped surprising me. It got to the good part fast. You know, like Shane said, the the first playthrough is is not very long. Um, it is a blast. It, yeah, it's super fun to play. Um, and and even by like ending D, it will throw whole new gameplay concepts at you that you haven't seen yet and you're you're seeing new things every every few hours in it which is amazing anyway a great game but other shows have probably talked better about it than i have so anyway go listen to waypoint they did a great episode about yeah, it we are we are the wrong podcast to spend 20 minutes on that game we sure are go on so i also want to give a shout out to D just because we've been playing over skype and we had a little bit of a break but now we're in a mega dungeon and uh, Shane is doing a great job as DM, bringing all of the backstory hooks, some of which you remember, some of which we don't. And uh, if you haven't played, we have a couple episodes where we just gush about how much fun it is. Um, don't let sounding like a geek and thinking it sounds, you know, like a lot of time investment keep you from playing Dungeons and Dragons. That is my PSA. Yeah, Dungeons and Dragons, game of the year 2017. I had never played until we played and it's been a ton of fun. Yeah, it's awesome. And a, another shout out to Shane for running a yeah, crazy well, campaign. Thanks for thanks for the props. But I, I, I will say this has been a year on D&D for me where I have really gone all in. I, I have never had uh, two ongoing campaigns like I have now. Um, and I'm, the more I get into it, the more I really appreciate the game itself. I, I, there's... There's some changes going on in D&D in 2017 that I'll just I'll just include right now and that is the imp- there's a lot of improvements in the tools and the release material. 
Um, the there's D and D Beyond came out this year. D and D Beyond is a online way to um, build characters and to use the books uh, and to you know, buy books for for D and D and uh, it. For people, more and more, D and D is becoming an online game. Um, it's becoming really big on you know Twitch streaming. It's something where people are organizing and playing this game that, for me, was fundamentally a tabletop game. And I've, I've played it. You know, I played D and D in an era where the internet barely existed. So uh, it's very odd for me to watch this transition, but it's really wonderful to see it blossoming in this way and there's so many more players now uh, than there have been at any other time when I've played uh, it's wonderful I, I started posting online about my home game that I, that I run out of my house uh, in my in-person game not with you guys and uh, players have been like banging down the door to get in and it's really weird like that's never been the case it's been it's it's never been easier for people to for you to find a D&D game to join or for you to start a D&D game and run it. And so um, to me, that's that's been one of my biggest gaming experiences of 2017 is just having all the D&D that I can handle, which has never been the case in my entire life, even though I've always loved it. So that's that's been a really wonderful experience. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's and really good point about the like the tools getting better and that that shift to to online play. Like I don't think I would have been able to play nearly as much D and D in person, but playing with you online this year has been amazing. It's been fantastic. And D and D Beyond is super rad. I love their. Uh, it took a little while to get it going, which you would expect because they've added a ton of options. But it's it's been really nice to have that central location. We were using. Yeah various you know google docs and things and they've really streamlined it and made it pretty smart and it's not even the only tool out there like roll 20 is incredibly popular uh and in a lot of ways much more feature rich and they now also sell a lot of the kind of D &D wizards of the coast core content right through there as well so Hmm. um this has been a year where the creators of D D are beginning to really work with these third party tool makers and it really is changing the game in some fundamental ways uh, in terms of making it more accessible for more people uh, to want to play in more new and different ways. So it's, it's really neat thing that's happening this year and ongoing. Yeah. Uh, so before we jump into the uh, sort of 2018 and looking ahead and things we're excited about, uh, I wanted to do a couple things. First, give a shout out once again to our listeners and those who reach out to us Uh it's phenomenal hearing from you and and you know we we love sort of the tiny community that we've been getting going with everyone that reaches out to us and uh and the conversations that we've been able to have and so with that i uh i asked you know what your favorite games were the listeners uh of 2017 got some good responses so i wanted to read some of those and uh maybe spark some conversation from that or at the very least appreciate those who wrote back uh so uh, Ninja Ninja Muffin ninety nine wrote in that their favorite shorter games were Emily is Away two Sonic Mania everything a normal lost phone and another lost phone and then their longer favorite games were Cuphead and Getting Over It I think we at least discussed doing every one of those games on the shorter list that they gave um, and we'll probably get to some of those in twenty eighteen I think some of those are already on our list particularly the uh. The Lost Phone games. Yeah, yeah, I've played a bit of those, and uh, we haven't gotten around to doing an actual episode on them yet. But they're they're definitely sort of on the short list. Uh, we'll we'll probably talk about what our short list is because there's a lot of yeah a lot of uh, carryover from 2017 into 2018. I'm afraid some of this is going to bleed over for sure. So the next one uh, at Super Pouring, uh, who reaches out to us a lot, said, "I think Steam World Dig Two is close to short game territory. That Sonic Mania, Battle Chef Brigade." mummy demastered demastered are a few of their favorites i'm really excited to try uh battle chef brigade i bought it on my switch and haven't actually really booted yeah. it up yet but like i love food themed games just in general and it's it's really beautifully illustrated it's the kind of game i think i could find myself getting into very much also i'm glad to hear that steam world dig is shorter um i, I kind of need to do a little looking into that myself i haven't gotten around to actually playing that at all yet but 
it's uh, it, as I understand it, they took the Steam World dig or the like original Steam World digs kind of world and general gameplay style, but kind of shifted it in a more Metroidvania type direction, mm. which sounds like a blast. Like I, I'm I'm kind of jonesing for a Metroidvania right now. We haven't played one in a while. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Metroidvania. You just have to say that I'm probably in. Yeah, uh, I've not played those game uh steamroll at all but that sounds great um uh joe at joe boria friend of the show wrote my pick is mario odyssey tons of great games but mario was pure joy in a year where hate and tragedy dominated the headlines we kind of touched on that yeah, at the man. beginning of the episode i hear uh, you there kind of just all throughout and uh yeah i think we and uh, mario odyssey was just and is like i haven't finished it yet and i've kind of been playing it in small chunks to kind of savor it i guess but it is just absolutely an expression of joy. It's like an absolute yeah. expression of of like positivity and just there's no way not to smile while playing it, which is kind of important. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, good. At W wrote, uh, new games I really enjoyed this year were Cuphead, Dream Daddy, Kingdoms and Castles, Doki Doki Literature Club, and Finding Paradise. I also became obsessed with watching people play PUBG for a while. That is a pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty common thing right now. God, I, that I, has I, had such an amazing I, impact on video games in 2017, yeah. and I, I feel like such an like, like an uh, uh, outsider for not really having played any of it. I, I've watched some streams of it as well, and it is fun as hell to watch. Well, yeah. I haven't talked about it on the show, but I've been playing a lot of Fortnite uh, over the last month or so, which is a another Battle Royale game that's free on PlayStation. So if you're interested in that type of game, um, though it's way wackier, PUBG is pretty self-serious, um, and, and rightfully so, it's a cool game. Uh, but there is an uh, an option for like PS4 for Battle Royale called Fortnite. Yeah, so. I, I really want to try um, PUBG, but part of it is just that like I'm not 100% sure that my computer will run it. I, I've got a kind yeah. of a like a mediocre gaming PC. And also it's a uh, it's a kind of game that I don't typically enjoy. You know, competitive online shooters are not my thing. Um, it, this one seems like such a standout that like I feel like an enormous amount of FOMO for not having played it, but I've been kind of like yeah. handling that by watching like, like waypoint uh, streams it from time to time and they're fun to watch. And I've, I've watched a few other folks play it. It's a, uh, it's one of the most streaming friendly games I've ever seen because it's just a machine for creating little stories, you know, unlike yeah. anything like any mm -hmm. most online shooters, the story is two guys shoot each other. One of them dies, but like, PUBG, like every match is this like epic story of like friends trying to survive and the most funny and bizarre things happen as well. And yeah. it's just it just creates these amazing situations. Like that's that's what's really like such a win about PUBG. I I, I yeah. definitely respect the game, even though I haven't been playing it and probably won't because it's just not my bag. But it, it try wow. for try Fortnite with me. Fortnite's a lot of fun. I might give um, that a shot. I also yeah. I want to give uh, two shout outs to uh, two games that W uh, suggested, uh, which I'm going to say right now we're going to do in 2018. And that is Dream Daddy and Doki Doki Literature Club. I know yeah. Shay or Reagan, you've already done play these. Uh, we've had a, uh, a we had a steady stream <laughs> of, <laughs> of requests asking. for Doki Doki Literature Club. Yeah, as well. As and Dream uh, Daddy. I mean, it looks just it looks like just such a fun little uh, school life. <laughs> Uh, visual novel. You know, it it reminds so me of a couple and, of years and ago. And harmless and fun. I love it. And we thought that uh, maybe the like Dream Daddy spike would go over and we thought we missed our chance to cover it, but the the people have spoken that we they, still want us to talk about we those know what daddies. They want. So. We yeah. want Dream Daddy. Yeah. You know, people it's, want Dream Daddy. It's funny, like we haven't had so many listener requests to cover a specific single game uh, since uh, Undertale. Uh, Doki Doki Literature Club, like We've gotten a lot of people requesting that we talk about that game. I have played it. I do want to cover it. We just haven't had time to get enough, you know, kind of a quorum together to to talk about it in 2017. But that is coming probably pretty soon. Um, yeah. And uh, we may 
combine it with some other things because we've had a lot of requests for that dream daddy and also i really really liked i haven't quite completed it yet but i've almost completed butterfly soup now they don't have a lot in common thematically but they're all uh visual novels and we thought it might kind of make sense to kind of lump those together as an episode um or it might not we'll see uh but yeah, yeah those are those are coming in 2018 and uh sorry we haven't gotten to them yet i know lots of folks have requested uh doki yeah, doki in we particular. will though yeah uh, and then finally, uh, again, thank you to everyone who reaches out to us on Twitter. Uh, Bobby Pease uh, said, I was a massive fan of, Hor- of Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, and then he links to his uh, his podcast, who they're friends of the show. If you've not listened to The Casual Hour, it's a great podcast about tech and video games. And uh, Reagan and I have both been on it. And I actually got to podcast live from the back of a CeCe's Pizza one time uh, as, as a <laughs> yeah. guest on their show, which was a dream I didn't even know I had until I was doing it. Uh, so check out the casual hour. But uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, obviously not a short game, but um, that is consistently uh, what I hear is one of the best games of 2017 in that sort of genre. And yeah. I intend to get it soon. I'm, as well. I'm planning to pick that up, too, actually, because, um, yeah. I mean, I just got a PS4 Pro and it's one of the games that they'd say, you know, hey, if you've got a PS4 Pro, check out this game. It's gorgeous. And so I want to yeah. try that. Um, but also I'm about to finish, finally finish Persona 5. Um, and I've been, I'd been holding off on pl- picking up any larger games. I mean, I'm, I'm 120 hours into Persona 5, guys. Like, that, that game has... And, and I took a lot of breaks in in the middle of that to play things like um, like Nier. So like it, it that was my 2017, like my big game of 2017. I'm finally putting that to bed, and so I'm going to be looking for all of those big 2017 games that I might have missed while I was playing other stuff. And probably that's my next big pickup. So looking forward to trying that. I have one I've been playing that um, I I see, I've, we've had on our list here. I didn't realize anyone else was thinking about it, and it's Hidden Folks. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really, uh, I downloaded this game just because I was like, oh, hold on. There are hidden object games that aren't bad. Uh, I have, I have watched my wife play a lot of bad hidden object games. Yes. <laughs> so, There's so actually another good and... one where everything shipped like an owl, but, um, <laughs> yes. what? This hidden, is hidden folks is much game. more delightful. Uh, one of the first things that I found when I, so actually I, when I, when I was going to download the game, uh, I, did a quick Google search just to even find a download link for it. And um, I wound up on a um, imager album that I guess was posted to Reddit or something um, that was their development process. And it was really neat. Uh, So I I think this would be an interesting game to throw in. Probably not its own episode because it's truly a very simple game in which you are given a list of things to tap on and you tap on those things. It's Where's Waldo, but for 2017. So if anyone has any games that they would like to see paired with Hidden Folks, we'd love to talk about it, but it doesn't really stand alone, unfortunately. True. Yeah. Um, But like the development story for it is interesting enough that I think I'd love for us to fit it in the show somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Other games that have come out in 2017 that we are probably going to be covering on the show, uh, like first among them for me right now is uh, Gorogoa. Yeah, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, I've been playing that on my phone. It's also on the it's Switch. It's actually Goroga. <laughs> it very easily, It could easily be any of those. I have no idea. But it is a stunning game. It is visually stunning looking, beautifully illustrated. And it's the kind of puzzle game where... Nothing is particularly hard, but everything is particularly surprising and clever. Like every single time I try something and it works, I'm like, wow, that is very clever. And I feel smarter just for having kind of been taken along that ride with the game. It's it's amazing and gorgeous. And it's I really want to talk about it on the show, although I'm concerned that we won't know how to explain it. Like it's a game that is so unique in the way that it you play it that i think just describing it and not actually seeing it in motion might not make sense but we're going to do our best to cover it in 2018 i think we'll find a way yeah we'll figure it out what else is on our list of things to cover in 2018 so you might have a favorite that we didn't play we've got a couple other things that people might have mentioned or that we have our eye on that we'll post in the show notes so if you want to give an upvote to those uh, to make sure they definitely get on our radar, please let us know. 
we made a whole list while we were preparing for this episode and uh, take a look at it. If anything stands out at you um, that you make, you really want to see us cover sooner rather than later, let us know. And if there's something that's not on that list that we missed in 2017, we want to hear about that stuff too. Um, you know, if it's not on that list, that doesn't necessarily mean we've decided not to cover it or something like that. There's a lot of good games and we miss them all the time. And yeah. so like uh line light, what, one of my favorite games of 2017 came specifically from a recommendation that I would not have known about that game if they had not oh, yeah. uh, reached out to us. And uh, that that's just one of a, a number of games that we have played specifically because of recommendations. Yeah. So keep them coming. Yeah. Um, so 2018 is looking pretty exciting. We've got that whole big list of things from 2017 to catch up on. But there's also a few games that I have been waiting for for a long time, I the, that we all have, I guess, um, that are coming out we hope, uh, you know, barring unforeseen circumstances in 2018. Um, the big one for me is Manifold Garden. Uh, I've been looking forward to that game for a long, long time. I, I think I played a early kind of demo or like vertical slice of it at uh, PlayStation Experience, whatever the very first one was. I think it was like 2015 or something. I, I may be getting the year wrong, but anyway, it feels like it's been a decade since that game was announced and I've been sort of following along with its development on Twitter and he does Twitch streams from time to time. It's, I think, I think it has the potential to be like the next big first person puzzle game. You know, this might be the next portal or the next, the witness, you know, this is, it it seems like a really, really good concept, beautifully executed. It looks like an amazing, gorgeous visual game so can't wait for that to come out and i think it's coming out in 2018 i think so i'm really hoping for it this time um what else is coming out my long delayed that i still want is donut county it's never going to come out but i really want to play a game where you play a hole in the ground i just i just want it so badly i really think that one's coming this year guys i really think this is the year we've had this conversation before (laughs) i think we did this is this is exactly what we talked about at the end of the but you know hey like tacoma and uh and edith finch both seemed like they were never ever going to come out and here they are in 2017 uh so i mean we got we got uh the last guardian at the end of last year guys like things miracles do happen games do get finished from time to time i i just want to i just want to say that my god this was the year 2017 was such a weird year and an amazing year for video games that the last guardian actually came out and i didn't get around to playing because there was other really good games out i can't I believe i'm saying those words we bought it i have it uh-huh. it's another one it's another one that was like well of course i got to pre-order the last yeah. guardian and then it, it arrived i have a physical copy of it uh molly got it um for uh as a gift and it was like okay we'll get to it at some point it, it um <laughs> I, my games. hype for that game my unreasonable hype for that game is a matter of public record on this podcast and i didn't get around to playing it yet i i did play it and i didn't really like it which makes me feel that's sad. not the point though yeah. <laughs> we're talking about a game that's been you know, i know i know looked been looked for for 20 years yeah. Well, anyway, um, 2018, <laughs> it's going to be a big year. Yeah. And a couple of things I'm looking forward to. The Little Book fan folks have a game called Dreams, which I hope is another great creativity engine game. Um, the lead designer for Monument Valley has a game that he's calling a comic and a video game romance called Florence. Oh, I haven't heard about that. I'm very interested in. Reagan's ears pricked up when he heard the word romance. There's a... PSVR talking mouse game. Yeah, oh my gosh, I'm... yes, Moss. Yes. Moss, okay. Which none of us so... can play, but Shane can talk about. <laughs> oh, I'm so I'm I'm hyped for this one. Um it is I have seen uh from this game, it is a game that you play by looking into storybooks and watching and and helping a mouse uh who you can pet. And who is uh, wields a sword in defense of you, I suppose, or the world or something. It just looks so cute and so nice. And guys, uh, PSVR is 
actually getting really good. Like PlayStation Plus has st- started dropping PSVR games every couple of months. Uh, so like my P- PSVR collection continues to grow. Um, I finally got around to um, to playing uh, Resident Evil 7 in VR. This has been an incredible year of, for VR. Like I, it seems like the rest of the VR craze is maybe starting to die down a little bit like it seems like HTC is I'm not even sure if HTC is still going to be a company at the end of next year (laughs) uh, when the Vive has done pretty well but PSVR has has had a really successful launch and it's it's a it's I would say as a product it is a success and like the prices on it are starting to come down I I I see more and more people continuing to buy it that's like that's all I've been waiting for is a little bit lower price on it really I mean it's getting there and and, and and the games are good. There are a lot of them, way more than I would have expected, and in way more genres. And they, it continues to be something that I that I pull out of the drawer and connect to my PlayStation Four. Um, maybe maybe once a month or so. Maybe sometimes a little more than that. Which for a console accessory is way more than any previous console accessory. <laughs> and the games are legit. Some of them are really good. So yeah, if uh, if we were talking about um, some of the best individual moments of gaming in 2017 for me, um, you know, I talking about like the end of uh, Edith Finch, probably one of the best, if not the most intense real life moment, was playing Super Hot VR. That oh, was man. so phenomenal. I, I could do that just forever. I felt like I could just never not be playing Super Hot VR. So agreed. Yeah, super hot. And they're actually releasing a new super hot VR, like a sequel to super hot VR. Oh yeah. That, oh, that's right. The is that is that the add-on that they're doing that's like um like adds a roguelike element to it? Is that is that what that was? Uh yeah, something like that. I haven't seen all the details on it, but it it makes it more of a campaign focused game, and uh I'm all about that. Sounds great. I cannot wait to play some of the stuff that's coming out in 2018. So, and you'll finally get your Altos Odyssey. Oh yeah! Oh my God, I'd forgotten uh, until you just said it just now. Oh man, you don't know how much time I sunk into Altos Adventure, and uh, you know I don't care if Altos Odyssey is literally just reset the leaderboards and re- reset the achievements list and let me do it all again. I'll do it, no problem. I. I don't know how much time you spent on Alto's uh, adventure. I do know, however, that for the first time, and maybe the only time ever on the short game, you actually went into an episode and edited in your voice to tell the listener what your updated Alto's adventure uh, high, high score, score was. was. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, it, it's up even higher than you heard then. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I can't believe you haven't gone in and made new updates and re-uploaded the episode for, for more uh, uh, current Don't listeners. give me any ideas. <laughs> Honestly, anytime there's a lull in the feed, you might as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, 2018's looking good, and uh, I I cannot wait to play some Alto's Adventure while uh, while downloading Manifold Garden, I guess. So looking forward to it. Um, anybody want to leave us with any uh, thoughts on 2017? <laughs> oh, geez. Sum it up. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> there's a lot of good in this world, and a lot of that is in these video games that we've been playing. So uh, it might not always seem that way. I but... would like to uh, say there's a lot of bad in this world, and so we want to get out of it and get into other worlds <laughs> through these through these video games. I, I think and one of the best worlds. things about 2017 has been uh, completely surrounding my head in video game hardware uh, to blot out the entire universe. <laughs> and your baby. <laughs> Also, I had a baby. He's he's great, guys. He's a great baby. <laughs> he is a very good baby. Um, 2017, it was tough. Uh, I'm looking forward to a new year because I think it might be better um, in a lot of ways. But, like, you know, this this stuff actually does help, you know? I, I, I think it's – I don't want to go too over the top with it. I personally – uh, I personally had a pretty good year, all things considered. It's just been a trying time, you know. Um, we we live in this really difficult time. Um, but you know, be 
be excellent to each other, I guess. <laughs> oh, man. Good old Bill and Ted reference to, to bring it back, bring it home at the end of 2017. Yeah. Solid. Well, um, thank you guys so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. Uh, you can find our show on the web at www.theshortgame.net or you can find us on Twitter at underscore short game. Uh, either one of those is a great place to get in contact with us. I mentioned earlier that you can check the show notes for a list of games that we may be covering pretty soon, but we want to hear from you about that list and about anything else that you think we ought to be covering. Uh, 2017's best games that we missed or uh, 2018's games that you're looking forward to. Um, just let us know either at www.theshortgame.net with a contact form or at, at underscore short game on Twitter. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Reagan K. That's R-A-Y-G-A-N-K. Uh, Laura, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Laura J. Nash. Nate, where can people find you? On Twitter at Nate STL. And Shane, where can people find you? I'm on Twitter at 8 Shane. Uh, and I want to include a call out to our listeners. Uh, this year... I think we played a lot of games that really came in at the upper limit of what we call a short game. Games that are in the <laughs> yeah. neighborhood of about Eight 10 to hours. 12 hours, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask our listeners, we love your recommendations. I really want recommendations for games that can be finished in five hours or less. I know those are th- hard games to find. I know that some of those games suck. I really want <laughs> you to recommend that kind of game to us that is all yes and i can't wait to play them and uh looking forward to hearing from you all in 2018 uh happy new year and uh thanks for listening to the short game <laughs>